Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. Happy to be back for a new season, uh, new interviews right here on YouTube. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and support the channel and uh, even the Patreon link in the description. You can ask questions of the guests. We've got a great guest today. I was thinking about doing a show here that was going to be about uh, some of the bands that didn't receive the notoriety that they should have. There was a lot of bands that I really enjoyed listening to and I thought, why wasn't this band uh, bigger? Why do not? Why do more people not know about this band? And I was compiling my list, and uh, I ended up in uh, Hinkley, Minnesota, of all places, with Stephen Piercy, and on the road. And I saw Dean Roberts from the band Leatherwolf, and Leatherwolf was at the top of my list. And so I thought, what a perfect. Uh, time to have Dean on and it turned out to be a perfect time because there is a brand new Leather Wolf record Kill the Hunted Which is available everywhere right now. We're going to talk to Dean about the history of Leather Wolf and uh, What's happening now all that and more right after this Here he is. Please welcome Dean Roberts. Oh, <laughs> he's making an entrance. Okay, dude. Sorry about that. No, you're back. Okay, I gave you. A I just wanted. To, I, I got the new CD, so I was like, "Oh man!" I gave you an incredible introduction, uh, but you missed it. But you'll you'll see it. You'll see it when it airs. I'm glad you're here, Dean. Yeah, sorry about that. Just, you know, uh, I was saying we saw, well, we got a chance to look at the artwork while you were gone, but I was telling people that we, we ran into each other in uh, Hinkley, Minnesota, uh, and we got to talk a little about Leatherwolf. And it's funny because this year I've been on the road with Stephen Piercy. We had a show in Colorado, and I saw your bass player, Paul oh, Carmen. Yeah. yeah who, uh, for years now, he's been running a backline business out of uh, Colorado, and he provides the backline. A lot of rock and roll shows, and I ask him about. Le I ask everyone about Leatherwolf when I when I see them. I was fortunate to work with uh, uh, Michael Oliveri, the original singer. He would sub for a band here that I had in town called the Sin City Sinners, and he came and did a bunch of shows. And so I've always uh, enjoyed Leatherwolf's music. And as I was saying, I wanted to do a show about bands that really should have uh, made it bigger. I know you've heard this a million times, uh, and I'm sure you wonder the same thing: what happened? But I think for those watching who don't know that much about Leatherwolf, this band goes all the way back to 1980. This is you, you weren't like a, you didn't just come out in time for the Sunset Strip. You were there before a lot of bands. Tell me about the beginning of Leatherwolf 1980. Um, well, Leatherwolf started with me, or no, with Carrie, Jeff, and I. Um, me and Carrie went to high school together. Um, so my senior year, we started, uh, thinking about playing and then, um, started, started a band and then we played a, uh, like a weekend party at a club or at a, uh, at a warehouse and ran into this band called rage and Jeff was a guitar player and Jerome seven was a bass player. So we just joined up with them and started, um, just playing Judas, Iron Maiden, uh, you know, Zeppelin, all that stuff back in the day and just playing parties. And then um, like a year later, um, we just couldn't really, we had a bunch of different singers. So Mike was friends with Jeff from, from high school. So he brought him in as a guitar player, you know, so we were just gonna play play music until we found a singer and just put, have three guitar players just because, you know, we practiced four or five days a week and, you know, it gets kind of boring, you know, not having a singer. So Mikey um, could sing and he just, eventually became the singer. And, um, you know, like in 1982 or 83, we just started uh, migrating up to Hollywood, playing the Troubadour, the Gazzaris, the Whiskey, and uh, the Roxy. And um, during that time, uh, it was just, it was fun. We played parties and played those clubs, and it just was a fun time back in the 80s. Yeah, and, you know, Leather Wolf's career has always appealed to different uh different fans and different genres. There's sort of the uh, Street Ready, which is the album that kind of broke the band, would be more of a commercial, make fit Sunset Strip, but a lot of the other stuff is also very heavy. And it, when you guys were starting out, you were playing with bands like Metallica and Slayer, right? 
oh yeah, we were playing clubs with those guys. We even played some parties with with Dave Mustaine and you know back before they were you know went at the you know probably freaking 1980 before we even played together at the at uh, Radio City, you know, mm-hmm. and um, you know it's just so weird when you're so you know you're freaking 20 or eight 19 and you're um these bands that you play with you know eventually make it you know it's, it's interesting yeah and uh and as you're watching the bands make it you're waiting for your own uh chance to make it leather wolf really stays at it the first album in dangerous species comes out in 1985 uh, so that's uh tell me how that record comes about um, I think it was earlier than that. I thought it came out in 83, but I don't remember exactly remember. It might be hard. Yeah. Was that 85? I think it was 83. Okay. Maybe, you're maybe you're right, dude. Um, so, so, um, um, we, Jeff started writing songs like, um, Spider, Season of the Witch, Kill and Kill, Kill and Kill Again. Um, off the track, you know, just some cool stuff. And um, I I knew somebody that was attached to uh, it's called Trop- Tropical Records, but they were it was a, they were they were a different label um, that lived in Garden Grove where I lived in. And um, so we were uh, he asked us to to make a record, and but then I got a motorcycle accident, so I was out for a little bit of time. And then once I got back into playing again, um, we went, made that record. Um, at the music grinder. Um, and it was, uh, that's where I recorded my drums and it was just fun. You know, we were, I was like, what? 22. I'm making a professional record with some good guys. And, um, it was just fun making a record, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so this is where it begins. What's interesting is that the next record will be a self-titled record. (laughs) You guys are the band that follows up with the self-titled as your second record. Well, we can just say that just shows you how stupid we are. <laughs> and young. Right? Well, we just, we, you know, we were more into playing and stuff. I don't think we were thinking about that stuff, which we probably should have thought about it, but I'm, you know, I didn't think about it. Mm-hmm. Here is the self titled debut record. Uh, self, excuse me, the second self titled record. It's not debut. This is from 1987. And at this point, you guys are getting more attention. You're still early to that scene, um, but there's this one has, uh, well, it's got some great tracks, Rise or Fall, uh, my favorite, but uh, also the single, The Calling, uh, off this record. And you get a little bit of MTV play as well, right? Yeah, yep, that, that's what happened. Um, you know, it, on, on Island Records, it was just, it was a little funny for me because, uh, it was Kevin Beamish and it was, it wasn't, it wasn't such a heavy metal production, you know, it was more, uh, Oreo speedwagon ish, you know, and I've always just kind of like more heavier hard rock. So, but it was, it was interesting, you know, that, that, that whole process going to the Bahamas and making a record and, um, writing with these guys, it was, it was definitely fun, you know? When you play these songs live, you can tell they were meant to be heavier songs. Uh, you know, some of these tracks, the lot, the way you play them live is heavier than maybe the way they were recorded or produced. Well, I just think, um, you know, the bass and the drums just didn't get their due justice on, on this stuff with, with those type of uh, producers and those type of mixers. You know, when you go back like to the first record where Randy Burns did it, it, it sounds more metal, you know, it sounds more heavier. It's cause it's got more drums and bass, you know, mm-hmm. but I, it was too funny. Um, I wasn't there. Um, when they when they mixed you know i think carrie and jeff and mike were there um when they mixed it um so you know they weren't looking out for me yeah uh, yeah i i get it did you feel like island maybe didn't know what to do with the band occasionally you have that problem with labels um i think um, island records um is a business and they just thought the metallica thing was was coming alive and they wanted to pick up a metal band but they just didn't know how to market it um they had you know u2 all these big radio bands you know so i I think it was a thought of trying to pick a band to create that but they just didn't follow through with it you know i mean because when we went on tour in europe that's what they, the, the, the Island Records guys just said, hey, we're trying to turn you guys into the next Metallica. I'm going, 
you should have got a different producer, you know? Mm -hmm. It's you, you make a good point and maybe people don't realize, but at that time labels were all trying to get what it, whatever was big. They need to have it. Every label had to have the next Metallica, the next Guns N' Roses, the next, and sometimes they suck up all the bands. It's exciting to have a record deal, but then they don't, as you pointed out, they don't exactly know what to do with you. I think they know what to do is, but their whole, their whole technique is, um, you just, you just sign a bunch of bands in a certain realm and you throw it out there and see what sticks, you know? And, um, and, uh, you know, we were much heavier than, than the recordings made us. So it kind of put us more in, in, uh, like a glamish kind of vibe ish, I think from, from that point of view. But, um, you know, we got close, you know, we sold like two, 300,000 and, you know, once you go gold or whatever, then, then you, you get a little more, more support from, from the labels. And, and plus you get more support from the, the live part of playing music. Then you can go out with bigger bands, you know? And Were so, you guys playing shows with some of the bigger bands at that point? We had a few shows, you know, like we played with Ted Nugent, we played with Queens Rye. Um, we played a few shows, but it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't like going on tour with Judas or Iron Maiden or, right. or UFO or Michael Shanker, or, you know, it wasn't that type of deal at all. But they tried. I mean, I, I you know, hey, they, they tried to get us out there and tried to get us, you know, in front of people. 1989, uh, when I, I was a younger man, I had a friend give me a cassette of this album, Street Ready, and I just loved it. And I thought it was, uh, and again, I thought all the songs had a hook. And I thought it fit at that time very well. You guys probably would have rather have gone in the heavy direction, but I really thought that this is something that should have uh, uh, that had all the elements. It had some heavy songs, thunder, uh, you know, stands out, and uh, it had ballads, the way I feel, lonely road. I felt like this record had a lot that would fit in at the time, but and there were videos, uh, but. Somehow it sort of got lost in the shuffle. I think most people discovered Leather Wolf um, with this record. Um, yeah, it was a good record. Uh, I think it was a popular record. Um, what can you do? Uh, we just went to the Bahamas, did the best we could, came back, and, you know, things kind of fell apart after that. The glam direction definitely shows in the videos here. Was it a conscious thing? Like, okay, we better fit in with these other bands? I just think that was the mentality of, of the group of us. You know, I, I, I never was really into that. You know, I was into Judas, into Iron Maiden, you know, into heavier stuff. I never was into the, the fluff the fluff type of stuff. But, you know, a band is a band, and they're going to do what they're going to do, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and right, there's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of people in a band. It's more than just one decision. I think. So, yes, for sure. I think as your career goes on and your involvement with Leather Wolf um, steps up, I think the music gets heavier. We'll talk about that obviously when we get to uh, the latest album. But uh, so at, at this time, what, what what kind of shows are you guys playing around now? What, how are they promoting and pushing you? Right now? No, Back I'm talking about with Street Ready. I think they put us on a tour around the United States for like a month and a half. And I think that's, that's when we, the first time we went to Europe for, to play with Bow Wow and to play a couple, we play with Queens Rye and play a couple festivals. But at the end of the day, uh, there wasn't enough shows. We didn't, um, we didn't get in front of the public that much, you know, in our own hometown, you know, we were popular so we could do, we could do good in our own town or up in, or up in Hollywood. But when it came to other towns, we just weren't so, you know, like a wanted item or however you want to say it. Yeah, they didn't know. Uh, people didn't know what, what to expect or what was coming. Yeah, it, 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 which was a difficult thing to break out of uh, your, your, your home base. I'm sure you meet people now in your travels, younger people who are influenced by this album and the albums before it as well it seems like it's never gone away i feel like people discover this that's why i like to bring attention to bands who have albums that uh maybe some people missed um you know most of that record was written by jeff gayer and even most of the vocals you know um i just wish we would have had a different production of it and just spend a little more time on trying to stick towards the heavy side but 
at the end of the day, um, Jeff and I were probably the more heavy metal guys of this group of guys, you know, and, you know, when you're dealing with other people that want to play hideaway or play lonely road or play these type of songs, you just, you just do it out of, to be fair. You know, you don't want to shoot somebody down with their ideas, but that's, that's why when, when, um, when we did the world Asylum and it was just Jeff and I, it's just metal, dude. It's just, it's just metal with flying guitars all over the place. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. So, after the uh, after Street Ready, um, you and and Mike stay together, but I believe the other guys uh, all all no, leave. It. No, no, no. Mike um, kicked me and Paul out of the band. Oh, they stayed together. I apologize. Yeah, they stayed together. They they kind of um. It's too funny, you know. Who 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 broke up Leather Wolf? What's well, the three original songwriters? You know, they wanted to go in a different direction. They wanted to play this other kind of music. You know. And, um, you know, I was drinking and partying a lot back then. So, so it really benefited me. I, I kind of, um, just started looking at the industry and looking at my friends and looking at the stuff and just started realizing that I needed to make a change in, in how I was living my life, you know? Yeah, a absolutely. So they continued not, not for very long, um, but they did try to continue. There's no uh, recorded, uh, there's no record, uh, at that point. Well, they were close. Um, but I think they were with Epic or they were doing something, but it just never panned out, you know, and you, did, I, you listen to it. It's, it's, I don't know. I, don't, I just don't see it. Um, it's not my favorite style of music. It may have been, uh, too late at that point as well for that style as, uh, things were about to change. Now, years later, uh, you made a record called World Asylum. We're looking at New World Asylum right here. And the difference being uh, in 2006, you put out the record World Asylum with one singer. In 2007, you had Michael Olivieri come back to the band and re-record the vocals, right? Yes. And, uh, and so this shows the heavier edge. This is the stuff that you and Jeff wrote mostly, right? Mainly Jeff, and I did my put my two cents into it. But this was something that we worked on for like three years. Um, and, um, I regret doing this, letting Mikey sing on it. Cause he didn't do anything writing wise or anything on this record. I just got put in a bind because we wouldn't play bang your head with Wayne and, um, he quit. So now we got this new record and, um, we got no one to go play it. So it was just, a, it was a, it was an interesting time. And I just, I just wish that, um, I just, I'm, that World of Silent would just stay this World of Silent because because Wade actually did a really good job on singing on that record. And he mm -hmm. he was a main part of putting all those songs together and 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 um, making it what it was. Yeah, I, I understand the decision be, uh, to try with Michael because you want to have, you know, the idea of having the original singer is exciting to fans and it's something to try. Uh, you know, obviously it didn't work out for you guys in this case. Now, this is 2007. I, I should have pointed out that in 1999, the original Leather Wolf, the essential Leather Wolf, the core lineup, the Street Ready lineup, gets back together and you you play a few shows. I saw it here in Las Vegas at a place called Pinkies that is no longer there. But yeah. for me, it was incredibly exciting because Leather Wolf was a band that I thought I would never get to see. Yeah. Uh, and I never thought I would get to hear those songs. And so it was exciting. I got my record signed by the band and, uh, you know, it was a really cool thing. You guys uh, have trouble keeping a lineup together. And I will say, though, with certain bands, uh, you know, the fans go, well, how come you don't have the lineup? But it is always, there's always not a budget for it. And sometimes bands can put up with different personalities when there's money for it and there's touring and there's all these things. Uh, it's harder at, at, at the level that you guys may have been at. Tell me, and we should point out that right now you are the only member of Lever Leather Wolf, the only original member in the current lineup. You have tried in and out with all the other guys. And so tell me a little bit about how you became the sole member. Oh, how did I, I just stuck it out. You know, I mean, I was, I was one of the original guys and I'm not into playing for tons of bands. And so I just wanted to play music. And um, when it came time, after the 
the, we broke up and got back together and played those shows and made that live record um, to make a record. Once again, Carrie and Mike never showed up. So Jeff and I just did it. And then, um, um, we liked it and, um, and then we just decided, um, to let Mikey sing so we could, um, actually go support the record and play shows. Cause we had a European tour for like, I don't know, I think it was 20 dates or whatever. And then we went on that tour to support that record and it was just a train wreck with Jeff. So that's, that's when we parted ways with Jeff. And so, um, um basically mike and carrie said hey let's just do this without jeff and let's just go write a record well four years goes by and no one writes nothing so i just decided to do a live record called unchain and, and just record it because i was bored you know mm -hmm. and then um yeah me and mikey stuck it out you know me and carrie ran into some problems because he's a thief and he stole all the public um information like youtube and freaking my facebook page so i just had a problem with him so we, we well, they, try to, they try to contest it too right they try to be leather wolf themselves um not back then there was no oh, that happened later because i thought there's a time when you guys were there was a little dispute over the name um that's just a bunch of internet stuff you know i mean those guys um it's basically carrie you know he was just irritated because he wanted to write a record and he wanted to use the name leather wolf and i I'd already been using it from the beginning, you know, with, with, we did world asylum and we did the live record. And then after he ripped me off, stole our stuff. Um, I just was done with him, you know, which is an interesting little deal. Um, so, uh, I, I legally got after, after he did that, I, I just legally got the, the trademark in 2012. So that way, I'm the guy that's paying for everything. I'm the guy that's making the records. I'm the guy that's doing, you know, at that point, I'd make, you know, two records, three records. And so, you know, that, that costs money. So I, I just did it to protect my investment, basically. You know, and then I started learning, well, with, with these type of friends, who needs enemies, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, so we do the live record. Um, and then me and Carrie have our problems before we finish. And then... Um, nothing gets written by mike or carrie ever and you know i'm just a drummer you know so i'm the guy that shows up does my parts and, and adds my two cents here and there with stuff you know except that's what was fun about world asylum is me and jeff got to sit around and just you know swap ideas and it was nice to to learn how these guys did their trade you know and jeff he is an extremely higher level player and an extremely talented songwriter, you know, all those cool leather wolf of songs, not the commercial stuff are his riffs, you know, and I've always just respected that part of that guy, you know? So when it, um, yes. Yeah, so, so after that, after 2012, we just released that record and just played shows every year, you know, one-offs, you know, went to Europe, played three or four shows or sometimes go out there for a week or two, play a couple shows around the U S I will point out, um, we're talking about the different styles, getting to know Michael and then also hearing his solo record, you can see that he's more of a blues rock uh, player, something I didn't expect, uh, you know, because I you expect the level of style. So it seems like he's interested in a different genre. Uh, yeah, so I think Mike would have done a lot better not trying to be a metal singer and just go stick to your blues and... Don't waste my time um, trying to be in a metal act, you know. Um, he's a very talented guy, but not when it comes to progressive, serious metal, you know. Yeah, so, I mean, I I can't not mention that, uh, I, I don't want to call it a gimmick, but the original Triple Axe Attack was one of Leatherwolf's angles that Mike also played guitar uh, as well, and you had three guitar players. Uh, that was one of the... The, the, the selling points. But as you say, I, I think that Leather Wolf was, was a, meant to be a little bit more of a progressive uh, metal band, at least what you intended. Well, we, we, all, we started off that way because Jeff is always a progressive writer. You know, Carrie and Mike kind of tamed it down a little bit just because of their talent. You know, Mike can't play those riffs. Mike can't write those riffs. Mike can't, he's, he's just not into it. You know, he's more of a bluesy, mellow, simple guy, you know?
which, hey, that's fine. But in my opinion, that's not what Leather Wolf is about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are uh, uh, fl uh, flying the Leather Wolf flag. And as you said, you have been almost always the one consistent uh, to, to do that. Just, just, I'm the one that just kept it going, just kept it funded, kept it going. And, you know, no matter, no matter who was in it or how it worked out, you know? Are any of those guys mad at you for continuing? I don't know, dude. I just don't care about those guys anymore. I'm just straight to the point. Either you're in or you're out, you know, just like, you know, when we were doing a record deal um, with Nuclear Blast, you know, I got, I got hit up from Nuclear Blast when we were playing a show. They want to make a record. So I talked to Mike about it and um, and we start working on it and he wants to write with two kids that aren't even original Leather Wolf guys. And, and I was just like, give me a freaking break. So um, I called Carrie, he wrote, I sent him a song that I was working on called, it's, it's a song called Nobody Now. But uh, I, I, had a, I had the parts and the drums and the arrangement and then he came up with a great guitar riff and he really helped, you know, polish it out, wrote the chorus, it's cool. So I said, okay, this is the direction I wouldn't mind going in, you know? And then he wanted to um, work with Jeff Gare. So I had to make a, I had to just say, okay, if he wants to do that, let's just see how it pans out, you know? Right. Now, during this time, Mike had told me, um, he's not gonna write with me. I don't like writing with you, Dean. I don't want nothing to do with that. I wanna go make a Leather Wolf record. You could pay for it. You could do all the work, but you ain't gonna write shit. And that's when I, I said, I'm done. I'm just done. And uh, so he was gone. And, you know, if you want, I can send you some of his tracks, you know, because there's some of these songs on this record that's with Keith in my arrangement. And there's some there's some I did with Mike at the beginning when we started this. <laughs> and so um, since I own the trademark and I'm spending the money, I just I said, OK, it's time to move on. Um, and Carrie, you know, he was part of this, too, but he just uh, he's he disappeared, didn't call me or nothing. MIA, you know, so now I'm, I got one less guitar player. And um, turns out he got in trouble with the FTC for uh, fraud, you know, taking money from the from people. Got, got He got convicted of a felony. And I think that's why he hasn't called me. And that's why he moved off to Costa Rica. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, usually I ask people, what's the chance of a reunion? But I think you may have <laughs> answered it. You are uh, actively promoting kills the hunted it's a, a good segue and here it is right here it's available everywhere go to leather wolf social well, media. it's funny because um some some of this theme is kind of about i mean i i just been working on my myself you know trying to become a better person and try to be fair and try to be you know have some some um integrity and character about how i live my life mm -hmm. You know, so so when I wrote the story about uh, the Kill the Hunted song, it was kind of sort of about a, a spiritual awakening, you know, and what I realized I was doing and what I realized I had to make some changes if I want to um, have a happier life, you know. So it was kind of it. The whole process kind of helped me get some clarity on. I on, believe uh, this is the record that you've wanted to make. This is a heavier album. It has melodic uh, things, too. It's not all uh, metal, but it's pretty heavy. And I think. Fans of that will enjoy it. Uh, you can, if you want to just get a preview of it, there's three uh, YouTube videos now, uh, lyric videos and a music video for Kill the Hunted, Hit the Dirt, and The Henchman. And uh, and then you can also go go buy the album and go support. Uh, the reviews, uh, Dean, are really strong, as you know. The, the metal fans, the metal websites, are all giving this record a very high uh, score. Yeah, I'm surprised, man, because it, it started off one way, but it ended up in a whole different ballpark, you know. So I got, I got a little, you know, when this was all going down, I was like, what am I going to do? You know, how am I going to do this? You know. So I was really happy at the end of the day with how it turned out, you know, because it was kind of fun, you know, when you got riffs and and arrangements, um, just to sit down and say, okay, what am I going to do on the second guitar? What's going to be the third guitar? You know, well, maybe we'll change this riff to that, you know, and. What do we want to write the story about, you know? So it was it was much more interesting to sit around with Rob and come up with parts and to see his ideas and the stuff that he was creating and how he, he was playing. Because he's such, I've never played with somebody that's at that level and as sweet of a guy as he is, you know? And plus it was just nice, you know, dealing with like Barry Sparks 
you know, a right, legendary Harris bass player. Based on the record, yeah. Yeah. And and dealing with George Lynch and dealing with Joel Holstra, you know, and dealing with some other higher level players that um, were nice, you know, not much drama. It was just fun. You know, so that was that was probably the funnest part of my of, of this record was actually uh, um, putting it all together and sitting around and just being creative about it. You know, you were playing guitar yourself, right? Um, I'm not really a guitar player, but um, when I wrote the the riff for Kill the Hunted, you know, I could figure out how to play those type of things. I could play the chords because there's just open notes in the chorus. You mm -hmm. know, so so when I wrote that, and I could play it well enough to you know record it for the album. So it was just kind of cool that I got to do that. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, you're you're seeing your vision. So what's uh, so you're you. I was excited to see you in Minnesota, but unfortunately, you suffered an injury to your your hand or your wrist. There it is. We, uh, you you fell right. Yeah, I fell off the fence like ten feet and broke my wrist. Yeah, and so you were unable to play that show, but the guys wanted to play it. You wanted it to go on, and you got a sub, and you, you and the show went on. You, you had a, a Leather Wolf show that night. Yeah, went on. Yeah, it was just, it was kind of funky how it was raining, you know. But it was cool. I'm just glad we got the opportunity to play. You know, I wish I could have played, but that was the first time that I um got to watch Leather Wolf without me in it. You know. What yeah? What a strange thing to watch your own band and you're you're not uh, you're not in it. Uh, you do play all the songs that people want to hear. You know a, a little bit of everything from the the Leather Wolf catalog. You know uh, which I think fans want to hear and also get introduced um, to these these new songs. What is the plan now? Records out. Uh, I know you can't play right now. Um, I should be ready to go like in a month and a half. I should be finally done with this thing. Um, you know, they just, it just got to heal now. I, they, they, there was a bar in here. They took it out. They had to reattach a tendon. It just takes about another month and a half or two, and they'll start playing again. And then the record's going to come out, so we'll see if we get any love from the industry to go play shows, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we want to play. You know, there's well, been some really, really good reviews and really, really good interviews, like with Japan and Germany. And um, I found out from Archalk that, um, Archalk Magazine, that, um, you know, we're in, the, we're in consideration for Album of the Month. You know, which is kind of cool, um, especially since we, you know, we're not doing any advertising with anybody. So that's just someone over there liked the record. And, you know, all the guys that I've done interviews with, you know, with Rock Hard and all those those bigger magazines just think it's a freaking cool record. Yes. And uh, and I think that will continue. The word of mouth is, is strong and we're spreading the word here as well about Leather Wolf's new album, Kill the Hunted, which is available everywhere. Check out Leather Wolf's website. Check out their social media. We'll have links in the description so you can get this as well even easier. I think people enjoy it. You check out the YouTube videos. And, uh, yeah, I think it would do very well overseas. I think that's a good market for you guys. Of course, there's the festivals and things here, like the M3 type of shows that you've played. But I, I think this could be a, a world album. Well, that's what I'm hoping for because I'm um... – I just want to play world of silent music and play this new record music and just play a couple of the old classics. I mean, but at the end of the day, you know, if you're going to fly under the leather wolf flag, you gotta, you know, if the crowd wants to hear certain songs, you just got to play them. You know, you got to play the calling, the thunder, the hideaways. And, um, but I'm going to pick the heavier ones like, you know, spirits, uh, rise or fall, um, season of the witch spider kill and kill again. You know, I'm always going to go to those, those cool, Jeff Riff songs, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've learned a little bit about the history of the band today and the different uh, the the division of the bands. Who who was the heavy ones? Who was the uh, the, the more pop stuff? And it, uh, it, it's really simple. You you got lazy people that that write simple stuff because they're goddamn lazy. And then you got certain guys that sit around for like 12, 15 hours trying to figure out how do we do something legendary that's freaking cool, you know. And so there's those are the those are the guys you want to hang out with the guys that'll come up with the stuff that takes a serious amount of talent to play you know and you know even when even when I wrote my drum parts um, you know it, I, I had I play water polo so I had shoulder surgery so my shoulders were out so I had to learn how to do a uh, uh, superior drummer so I could write my parts 
So, so once I started learning that and writing my parts, it just made it a lot more clear on what I wanted to play. You know, so when I actually went in the studio, I have to replicate what I wrote, you know? And so it, it's too funny because um, it took me 11 days in the studio to get these tracks done. You know, World Asylum took me three days, you know? So these, these were a little bit more trickier parts to play for me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I encourage everybody to take a listen the, the, uh, to the final product. Again, Kill the Hunted is available everywhere now. Dean, I wish you the best with the album, and I hope to run into you again on the road uh, uh, this year, uh, in, the, in the new year, I should say, and uh, and everybody enjoys the music of Leatherwolf. Well, thanks a lot for having me on, and you know, I wish everyone well, and I hope everything, buddy's doing good, and it was really nice running into you again. I'm sure we ran into each other in the past before, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I really appreciate you you spending some time and talking about the record. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and thank you to everyone for watching. Go out and check out the record, and we will see you again. Thank you very much.